in my experience in tropical fish keeping and the aquarium hobby, and honestly, what I think is one of the most interesting fish you can possibly keep is a freshwater puffer fish. Now, I say freshwater puffer fish merely because that is where my experience comes from. I have not been, I have no experience in keeping saltwater puffer, puffer fish, only freshwater. And I want to give you my five top tips for long term success on keeping freshwater puffer fish. Now, there are many species, different types of puffer fish. Okay, types is the wrong word. There's different freshwater puffer fish you can keep, ranging from a very small one as the pea puffer, all the way up to a very large one, which is the mabu puffer, and any kind of scattered in between. Pea puffers, we're literally talking about just about half an inch, maybe an inch, just little guys, where mabu puffers in captivity can reach up to 36 inches, three feet of fish. It's a big fish. I have kept... A variety of puffer fish through my career. I've kept pea puffers, orange abai puffer, I've had dragon puffers, I've had Amazon puffers, I've had Fahaka puffer, I've had a Mabu puffer. Rest in peace, Sergeant. Uh, Sergeant was taken from us in a very unfortunate way. But in many, many instances, I still have experience revolving around puffer fish. And soon enough, here, the 65 gallon behind us is going to be home to a new puffer fish, and I cannot wait. With my emotional past of puffers, I'm just I'm very excited to have one in my possession again. As I think they are, I say they're interesting, they're very interactive, and long term, they're a great wet pet if you have the right setup for them. So let's get into my tips on what's gonna going to give you the best success long term. Tip number one: we're talking tank size. Now you can imagine a pea puffer, that little itty bitty guy, or a mabu puffer, the really big guy. They're going to have different tank requirements of what's going to be ethical, but also just physically fit one of these fish. For a pea puffer, a five gallon tank, one pea puffer, you can have great success with that if you just want to have a little interactive buddy. Maybe you want a group of pea puffers, maybe looking at getting a 20 gallon tank or a 29 gallon tank. Then you start moving into puffers like the Shodani puffer, you know, the Spotted Congo puffer that can live in a 40 gallon tank its entire life. Then you start moving up into Fahaka puffers, where long term, you're looking anywhere from like 120 up to 180 gallon tank. And then you start talking Mabu puffers, you're talking custom tanks, and a custom tank comes with a custom price tag. You need to be prepared that no matter what puffer species you choose to keep, you need to be prepared to house that puffer long term. The biggest mistake I see and the easiest one to make is you buy a puffer, it's small, you have a 20 gallon tank, maybe a 55 gallon tank, readily available, they're not that expensive, and you tell yourself, when, it, when the puffer needs an upgrade, I will buy a new tank for it. The biggest thing that starts happening though is maybe that puffer grows faster than you were expecting. Maybe you can't find a 180 gallon tank locally for a decent price. Then you start looking and maybe you, now your only option is a custom built tank and we're talking 10 plus thousand dollars. You've got to be prepared to house this puffer fish long term. It's exciting looking at Mabu puffers as they are incredible. Having kept one myself, it was such a rewarding fish to keep, but I was ready to keep that fish long term. It's very easy to fall into that because you see it, you want it, you think I can do this. Take a step back and think about it. Would a you know a dragon puffer be better for me? Would a you know a a fahaka be puffer be ready for me? I I can get my hands on a 180 gallon tank. Maybe I already have one. So take a self awareness check and make sure you have a tank ready to house that puffer fish long term through its adult life. Tip number two. Now we're talking quarantine procedures for a puffer fish. In my experience, these do not differ from quarantining any other fish. You need to be prepared to have the correct medication to handle this situation. Most puffer fish are wild caught specimens, which means they're gonna come in most likely with a lot of internal parasites. You need to be ready to combat that parasite along with any other external injuries the puffer fish may have from shipping, transport, just arriving, whatever it may be, you need to be prepared to handle all fronts of this. My recommendation is to get the Aquarium Co-op bed trio that Corey has put together. And this is honestly what has given me the most success 
and proper quarantine procedures for a puffer fish. Now I would say I've gone through many species of puffers and this is the number one treatment I use, that, that quarantine, the med trio I use and have had the most success with. The biggest thing you need to focus on is deworming a puffer fish. That means we need to clear out all those internal parasites so the puffer can actually maintain a healthy weight through its life. This is not a one and done quarantine procedure. You need to be prepared to treat this puffer fish, get it eating, come back a month later, treat it again, maybe two months later, treat it again, maybe a year later, treat it again. You've got to be prepared to handle that long-term quarantine procedure for a puffer fish. But just remember, it does not change from quarantining any other fish. I read a lot of things that certain medications don't work with it because it's more of like a scaleless fish. If you stick with what is known, if you stick with what I'm going to say experts, I'm not going to consider myself an expert, but definitely Corey from Aquarium Co-op is an expert on puffer fish. Follow their procedures. And that's my tip is use proper quarantine procedures for your puffer fish for long-term success. Tip number three, this is going to be an obvious one. But we're going to get into, into the specific details of this one. Food. You've got to be able to feed your puffer fish. Now, I'm not talking grabbing a can of flake food or grabbing a can of pellets. You've got to be prepared to feed this natural predator what it naturally wants. Snails, crustaceans, clams, shelled foods. Now, we can't always mimic or match the exact diet a puffer is going to have in the wild, but we can get pretty dang close. Aquarium snails are honestly going to be your number one food source for a puffer fish. You need to have something that's going to grind down the teeth of a puffer, its beak. Without shelled foods, that beak will overgrow and it will make it very difficult, if not impossible, for a puffer to properly eat. When I lived in Texas, I had a couple Amazon puffers come to me that were not given a proper diet. And eventually that beak, their front teeth, they overgrew so so much that they actually had an overbite. They could actually not get their mouth around a snail or any other food to properly eat. I had to intervene with the manual beak trimming for these puffers to actually survive. And once they did survive, they actually went on an ambush predator hunt of all the other tank mates. In my tank, they went from very docile puffer fish to extremely aggressive puffer fish. And I think it was nothing near out of just survival. Now that they could eat, they were hungry and they were going to eat. More on that later. But you need to be prepared to give the puffer fish what they want. Shell, shell food, clams, clams on a half shell. Can you find them? Can you find them locally? Can you purchase them? Another great alternative is frozen salad shrimp. I've done both raw and cooked, no difference to me, didn't affect my puffer fish in any way, shape, or form. Feed it frozen. You need that crunch. You need that hard outer shell for that puffer to grind its teeth down on. Now, the other part of this is you've got to be prepared for the food bill that's going to come with the puffer fish. Smaller puffers like pea puffers, they take great to bloodworms. That's easy. Mabu puffers, when I had my Mabu puffer, right before he passed, he was about 10 inches. My food bill was over $50 a month just feeding this one puffer fish. You start getting into an even larger specimen, you could be tripling that food budget for one fish. So just be prepared for that as you have to go in thinking that. You have to, when you buy a puffer fish, you literally have to think as if you're buying a dog. Are you going to be able to feed this thing long term? And if you do though, you'll have great success with your puffer fish. So as I said, be prepared to have the proper shelled foods to feed your puffer fish. Tip number four, and this is another one that most people I think go, yeah, kind of no duh, but it's also one where most people have a really hard time keeping a solo fish in a tank by itself. That's tank mates. My opinion, puffer fish should be kept in a species only tank. I am also really bad at breaking my own tip as my 65 gallon tank, I have two yellow tailed eels in there that I'm hoping to cohabitate with the puffer fish I have shipping into me. Things like when I kept my dragon puffers though, they are such an ambush predator. No matter what I put in that tank, if I were to put anything in that tank, they would have eaten immediately. My Mabu puffer was much more chill with tank mates. My Fahaka puffer on the other hand, when I had her, I tried to introduce a small silver arowana with her, roughly her same size. 
She bit that fish in half. No questions asked. It was her tank. She was not having it. So you're going to hear all these stories about how you can't keep, my, you know, my Fajaka puffer never touched anything. Well, my pea puffers, you know, shredded this fish. I've kept pea puffers and a bed of fish together and never had an issue with it. But it's all these things that you need to determine for yourself. Now, a couple tips I have on tank mates is do not start with anything expensive. You have to be prepared that that puffer fish will eat its tank mates. You, I don't care what anybody says about how docile they are. Puffer fish have personalities. Some may handle it well, some won't. Remember those Amazon puffers I trimmed their beaks on? Beforehand, never had an issue with tank mates. As soon as I introduced them back into the tank from trimming their beaks, within 10 minutes, they were shredding all of their tank mates. So focus on things maybe like neon tetras, cardinals, something small, something that's not going to be agile, not going to be able to get caught by the puffers, but also something that's not going to bully your puffer fish at the same time. You need to very carefully determine tank mates with your puffer fish. And tip number five, the last tip I have for you is enjoy your puffer fish. Take time. Watch your puffer fish. This is not a tip that is going to give you long-term success, but why not enjoy your long-term success? Why not enjoy this elaborate species of fish in your care? Why not take time to watch it hunt through your tank, listen to it as it's crunching through a clam, the power of its jaws, and just the intricacy of what a puffer fish really is. One of my favorite things about a puffer fish is over time, I swear they get to know you. You walk in the room, they zoom to the front of the tank, they start begging for food. It's a fun, wet pet to have. And if done correctly, it's a long-term wet pet you're going to have. So that's, that's my final tip for you. Enjoy your puffer fish. Take time every day to enjoy your puffer fish. So thank you for joining me on this video. I hope these tips give you help you with your long-term success of your puffer fish keeping. And leave me a comment down below. Let me know, is there any other tips you would add? What's your experience of keeping puffer fish? Does this video make you want to keep puffer fish? I always enjoy hearing from you and I appreciate your time. We'll talk to you guys on the next one.